You're listening to The Jay Barker Show on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Hey, welcome to your Thursday as we warm up for a huge college football weekend. The Tide will be traveling down to South Florida. Auburn will be hosting Sanford. But guys, I'm going to have to lead the above the fold top headline story. Atlanta Braves beat Philadelphia last night 4-1. to one. They have clinched their sixth consecutive division title. This is an amazing baseball team. Last night in Philadelphia, Spencer Strider, 17 Ks. A record for a guy that throws nothing but heat anyway. Fantastic pitcher. So, Atlanta right now is 96 and 50. Do the math. That's 46 games over 500. They ran away with the division. And, and here's the stat I just read online a minute ago. That is Atlanta's 26th division title since they broke off into divisions. Highest in Major League Baseball. So kudos to the Braves, you guys. You know, I know I am a homer. I have been since the hammer. But I just congratulations to the Atlanta Braves. And I think I speak for a lot of us that have just been in the Atlanta fold for years and years and years. You you, you just got to believe that this is just the beginning because um, this is the best team in baseball. Lars, don't you think there's a lot of pressure on them to go ahead and win it all? If they don't, is this season a failure? I think it is. They got to win it all. Well, they certainly have the talent, and uh, you're the baseball expert here. What What is it about this Braves team that's so special? Is it just uh, the the combination of having elite pitching and elite hitting? Uh, is it, uh, you know, the, the manager just pulling the right strings all the time? What is it? Uh, it You don't have to be a stat head to realize why this team is so good, and it's the long ball. I mean, Braves love the long ball. They are setting all types of not just team records, but individual records uh, in, in hitting home runs. I mean, they almost hit 300 home runs this year. Uh, Justin Riley had one last night, a two-run that gave him enough of a lead to beat Philadelphia. But I, you mentioned something else, which I, I, I think is very observant on your part, about the manager. Snit has had to really manage his starting rotation. I mean, Max Freed's been hurt. Um They've got several other starters that they had to move up and down from Gwinnett, AAA. And then his bullpen, uh, he's had to shuffle those cards as well. So I would say first and foremost, it's that the Braves can overpower anybody and literally any pitcher they've faced. So it's the power. And then I just continue to marvel at the work that uh, Snit does in in the dugout. Um, He's a great manager of the game of baseball and even a greater manager of the players in baseball. So there you have my perspective, and congratulations to my brothos. Now let's uh, finish out the season, try not to get anybody hurt, and then go into the playoffs with a mat on. Uh, yeah, Matt's uh, switching to, to college football in a, in a story that doesn't involve anyone in this state. Uh, my favorite head coach this weekend is Jay Norvell who is the head coach at Colorado State. Uh, I've gotten to know Jay pretty well over the years. He's a college football lifer, and he's just, he's just had different jobs all around the country, including a stint at, at Nebraska. And uh, I've always just had the utmost respect for Jay. And this weekend on Saturday is the Rocky Mountain Showdown between Colorado and Colorado State. Uh, obviously, these two teams do not care for one another. And uh, Jay Norvell, I love him, I love him, I love him. He uh, had a sit down with ESPN, right, in front of uh, in front of the game this weekend. You know, they do all the interviews with separate uh, different players and coaches. And he said, uh, and, and then he was recounting his interaction with ESPN on his coach's show last night. And he said, I sat down with ESPN today. And I don't care if they hear this in Boulder or not. I told them I took my hat off and I took my glasses off. And I said, when I talk to grownups, I take my hat off and I take my glasses off. 
That's what my mother taught me. <laughs> and that was a complete dig at Deion Sanders because you know what? When he, he does his, his interviews, sunglasses, his sunglasses, his, his hat, and Sometimes even a, a even a hoodie, hat. even yeah. a, even oh, even really. a hoodie yeah. in, during his press conferences and media appearances, and then he went on to say, <laughs> "This is even better. They're not going to like us no matter what we say or do. It doesn't matter, okay? Mm-hmm. So let's go up there and play. That's just how I feel about it." Uh, I don't mean to take over the show, but I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of all that stuff, and I know everybody else is too, so let's go play. And so clearly what he is saying is I'm tired of the fact that these guys just lie. <laughs> they lie about being disrespected. They lie about what coaches have said about them. They lie about what other players have said about them. They manufacture this BS to uh, to get uh, this sort of self-motivation, us against the world mentality, and it has gotten to the point of utter ridiculousness. And again, I've said, you know, in, in politics and in life and in sports now, apparently, we are in a post-fact age. Facts don't matter anymore. They just don't. And, and Deion Sanders is example one, two, three, four, and five to me right now. And I just, it just drives me nuts as a, as a, as a, uh, as a writer and as, just as a fan in general. I just don't appreciate people exaggerating and flat out misrepresenting other people's comments. And Jay, uh, uh, Jay Norvell, to... Jay Norvell's calling him out on it. And I love it. Well, um, and you're so right in using that as a mirror of the way things are, particularly in our media today. I mean, you know, that they make things up. They they twist things around just on both sides of the aisle. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, in, both in sides. politics, There's too, no uh, both no sides no in, in media no. and politics and, and everything. You know, I, I think the Dion Sanders story was big and intriguing and we were all watching. But I agree with Norvell 100 and one thousand percent it's old it's tired (laughs) go play football win or lose take your hat and your glasses off talk to people and move on it's another reason why it's a uh, sign of respect why do you think golfers why do you think golfers always take their hat off on the 18th hole and shake the hand of the guys they played with because it's respect you know, and why does everybody take their hat off? Uh, I mean, especially in the South here, right? We we show oh, great respect. Yeah. You don't of, go uh, inside with one. The, 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 uh, um, you don't go inside. You don't. Blind. You don't have your. You don't. You don't wear your sunglasses inside. You know, it's just it's well nonsense. As far as they claim to get no respect, yet they offer none. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna quote myself on that. That's a good um, one. Any, anyway, I appreciate you bringing that up because I'm tired of it, and I honestly think that it's actions like this that will hurt. I don't know many SEC teams that would take him because of the way he acts. Um, you know, we kind of act and um, show respect and do things a little bit different in the Southeastern Conference. That is to say, I mean, if. Um, <laughs> If Lane Kiffin were to go somewhere else, um, I think there would be a call to Boulder. So, anyway, we'll see. Doesn't it? It's gotten to the point now. I never pulled for Nebraska harder than I did last week. Um, and now I'm pulling for Colorado Rams. State. Yeah, Rams. absolutely. Rams. And you know what? I think a lot of people feel this way now that didn't feel this way two weeks ago. Am I no, right? I think you're 100% right. I mean, it's just... Uh, what, what, what these guys are doing is just so uh, over the top, out of line. Uh, they are being disrespectful, uh, and they are, again, not being truthful at all. At you know all. What? Just like Norvell said, he's tired of it. He doesn't care what they say. Yeah. Neither does yeah. Colorado. <laughs> We'll see. It'll be interesting to see if Deion Sanders responds to this before the game. Oh, you know he will. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. Uh, and, and it won't be re- very respectful either. No. Uh, my prediction on that. Maybe I'm wrong. All right. Um, we need to talk about Alabama's offensive line. So I go to our offensive line guy, and that's the one and only Roger Schultz. Played center for Alabama, started four straight years. Back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, 
Roger Chelsea Baby will be our guest in a moment on Big News. Reagan, owner of r r Cigars, the Cigar Mansion in downtown Tuscaloosa. Located at 2703 6th Street across from the Home Two Suites. Come down to r and see why we're the ultimate cigar and bourbon experience. With over 165 bourbons and five private barrels, our selection of bourbon is unmatched. We have the best cocktails around and our cigar selection is legendary. Our lounge and service are world class. Come and experience the luxury of the mansion and see why it's a world-renowned cigar and spirits destination. 365 24-7. You'll find road and utility crews, tow trucks, law enforcement, and first responders working along Alabama's roadway. We're making improvements and helping our communities stay connected. We're working hard to make sure you're safe on the road. Now we need your help to make sure we're safe too. Alabama's move over law requires you to move over a lane when you see flashing lights on the roadside. And if you can't safely move over, please slow down. Visit drivesafealabama.org. Brought to you by the Alabama Department of Transportation, Alabama Broadcasters Association, and this station. Tide 100.9 Tuscaloosa West. Just a small chance of a shower this afternoon, otherwise partially sunny, the high 85. Tonight, fair with a low at 66. For tomorrow and Saturday, a mix of sun and clouds both days with scattered showers around. Highs between 84 and 87. I'm James Spam on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 79 degrees in Tuscaloosa. This is the Big Noon Sports Network. It is indeed Big News Sports. Matt, Lars, Justin. Hey, I want to take a minute here while we get Schultze online and remind everybody, Lars, where we're going to be tomorrow from noon until 2 and every Friday throughout the Alabama football season. We will be at Ennis Free right there on University Boulevard. Tremendous burgers and chicken sandwiches and chicken wraps and... Oh, last week, uh, Laura Lee ordered fried pickles that just dazzled. So, uh, please come by, join us, ask a question, get involved, sit back, uh, ha- have one of their 40 plus beers on tap and, and enjoy an afternoon. Alabama be a, it's going to be out of town, but the fans are still going to rally in Tuscaloosa. So yeah, absolutely. Hey, Matt, noon to two tomorrow. I just had to bring this up because I, I know that uh, I don't think you're going to be around in the second hour when uh, we do our picks with Reagan. Last week, Matt, over for you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> oh, and, oh and four. I think I went four and oh to oh and four. So, hey, <laughs> you, you know, you know what? I picked <laughs> like Alabama plays. <laughs> I was uh, one and three, and Reagan was two and two. So. Uh, yeah, so that was a that rough one. It's all about even now. Uh, you're four and four. I am four and four, and Reagan is four and four. So yeah, we are. Uh, we're even through two weeks, uh, picking against the spread, and uh, maybe next segment we can uh, pick the games, uh, or I can tell you what the games are, and you can give me your thoughts. But um, I think you. Well, no, you actually you didn't see it on the text thread, but uh, yeah. Are there any games? This is not a great weekend slate of games, Matt. Uh, in, in, and next week is, is fat, is amazing. Um, uh, and, uh, I don't know. Is there any, any games that really in, intrigue you? I mean, I'm intrigued by the Alabama game, frankly, uh, because of just how they're gonna, um, you know, how they're gonna bounce back and, and, uh, and sort of what, uh, what we see just from the the quarterback position um i'm also intrigued obviously with that colorado colorado state game um but like excuse me like i said uh this is not a uh it's not terrific uh duke uh they're at number 21 they're looking to go to three and oh when they host uh northwestern and Northwestern again is a team that's absolutely been gutted, uh, due to the, uh, the hazing scandal. Um, uh, you got Florida State traveling to Boston College, uh, Texas hosts Wyoming, uh, Penn State opens Big Ten play at Illinois, but Illinois is really down this year. Uh, Miami going against Bethune Cookman. I mean, there's just, uh, it, it's, it's weird. You know, you, you look forward to the season. And you kind of just wish that some of the, the, the good games would be spread out. 
and, and this week it's just uh, a, a bunch of duds. Well, unfortunately. I, I'm not necessarily. Yeah, but there are some games in the Southeastern Conference of great note. LSU is at Mississippi State. Um, yeah, that's a good one. And, yep, and yeah. Tennessee. How about Tennessee and Florida? Tennessee, the Florida have a chance. Uh, there are a couple of games, but right now, Roger Schultz, former Alabama offensive lineman center, is going to join us. Roger, it's Matt and Lars. How are you? Hey, that's the, hey, that's the same people that were together last time I talked to you. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. We haven't yeah. divorced yet. We can't yeah, pair. Yeah, that's unbelievable for Matt. I mean, that's great. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, oh, I could go in a lot of directions on that one. Well, yeah, a lot of people could. Uh, <laughs> the ones that I refused to accept and the ones that just left. Uh, but that is a story for uh, our Saturday show, <laughs> which doesn't exist. Uh, but Roger was my partner. How many years did we do the show with Terry Henley? Six, seven? Okay. Yeah, a long time. I, I, I tell you what, we did it till I started two teams. I started the trenches, and we were still doing two teams teaser, and that was about two thousand ninety three. So about seven years. Yeah, uh, we had a good time, and that was a very good show. We got good numbers on it. Um, yeah. But anyway, hey Roger, everybody was just all fired up about Alabama's offensive line, their weight, their size, uh, their meanness and toughness, and. Uh, they was Latham that said, uh, we're going to make people want to quit. Um, man, uh, I guess just to point blank the question. Well, hey. What happened? Hey, well, I guess he, hey, I guess he was right because all these Alabama fans have quit. They're about to jump off the bridge because the line's so bad. <laughs> so I guess in essence, it did work. So, uh, no, I guess that's one of the things that obviously they have to fix. I think there's a couple. I don't think they necessarily have the right five guys in there, the right combination of guys. I know, uh, you know, through spring and through the summer and through a couple of the practices before the last scrimmage, you know, that Ferguson was the guy that everybody was talking about at guard. He was playing that left guard, and, you know, Booker was that right guard. Everything seemed to be fine. But then they had to find a place for Dow Court, and, um, and he's kind of he's kind of struggled a little bit. I know the freshman struggled a little bit, but he is a freshman. He played high school football in Iowa. He's probably the, you know, I mean, I'll give him a, I'll give him a pass. Uh, and uh, but yeah, they got to get better. They got to get better. But the defense, you know, nobody's talking really about the defensive line. But I mean, they didn't do much against Texas either. I mean, you know, so there's some issues they got to work on. But hey, everything's fixable. What what were the biggest issues that you saw, just from a, a sort of a technical standpoint, with the uh, Alabama? Well, I can tell you this. Team. I can I can, I saw Dalport not help. One time there was a there was a guy there was a a guy kind of shaded the center to the left side. He jumps from one A gap to the other A gap, which is a hard block for the center, right? And the guard had Dalcourt had opportunities that we call it getting a McRib. That's when you just knock him in the rib, get a McRib sandwich, and he just like just what kicked. I was like, what are you hit somebody, man? I mean, then he started looking downfield to go hit a safety, and it was a pass. I'm like, dude. You got it. When you get a chance to get a McRib, get a McRib. I mean, you got to lay a dude out. And there was a couple of those plays. He didn't play very well, but that's just, I kind of watched, I went back and watched the film. And, um, but he's a six year guy, and I don't understand why Saban has him in there. But, you know, another thing I've kind of noticed too is, you know, there's a lot of guys that have left in the transport portal, offensive linemen that, you know, highly recruited guys like that Brockenmeyer kid, you know, the guy that's starting at right tackle with George that left, that's playing right tackle at Florida. And, you know, how Saban always brags about, you know, competing in practice. Like, you know, the hardest competition is in practice for your job. And, man, I don't know if they got – I don't know if they got ten guys that can play. I think they got probably seven, but we've only seen five. And, you know, I always, I always just wonder why Saban didn't jerk some – I mean, Saban usually jerked somebody out of there, you know. And the thing was, the center flinched two or three times and had a couple bad snaps. And I guess, you know, Dalcourt would be the other center. And – uh but – I guess the, hey, there it's all fixable, you know. And I think Texas is a. I don't want to take it. I mean, Texas is a pretty good team. I think a lot of people just are acting like they're North Texas. Uh, they're not North Texas. They're pretty good. That's a pretty good football team. Uh, did you ever have? To, I, I should remember this, Roger. Uh, did you snap much shotgun? Oh yeah. Hey, we played. Okay. Uh, we played Miami in the Sugar Bowl, and all my we were shotgun snap the whole time because. I had to go against Russell Maryland and Cortez Kennedy, two number one, number one draft picks yeah. on my shoulders. 
So, and if we weren't in shotgun, they'd have made about a thousand sacks. So I'm just saying, it was a good thing we were in shotgun because I sure wasn't blocking them. But why don't do, tell why anybody. Why do we see Roger? Why do we see the mistakes with snaps? And it's not just Alabama. Uh, a lot of teams do, and it just fig. I would think Roger. I would think after a while, and you practice it every day, it would just be an eight. You know, it would it would just be it you know, should, it yeah, muscle it, memory. Yeah. yeah, no, it it should be. I mean, but but people do like they do the dead snap now. You know, the claw snap where you know, and some do it like where they hold it like a pass and snap it. You know, everybody's a little different um, to whatever the comfortable center, but whatever the center's comfortable doing, but. Um, but, but, but what got him was he, it wasn't, you know, Tory had some bad, he had some stats that were a little low, which is sometimes, but I think too, when you're getting your butt kicked and you feel like you ain't got no help and you got to change, you know, you got to do something, you, it changes how you snap, right? Because now you got to maybe snap a little quicker or something, you know, I, I, I can always remember if we ever had to run a, a, a sweep that that was always a hard, because we'd be under center and we'd run a sweep, but the, the the quarterback had to ride me longer because I'm having to reach a long way, and then he's rolling out, the, he's turning out the other way. So, you know, we had a I had a fumble snap at the Vanderbilt game, and they pulled me out because of it. I mean, but it's a hard it was a hard block. But uh, and sometimes I think those centers start thinking, hey, I got help, and they flinch, and he flinched. You know, they had two flinches besides the bad snap. So. You know, he had snap, like you used to call those snapping fractions. But Roger, um, just looking at the game as a whole, what what was most surprising to you about Alabama's performance? Huh. I, I, I guess obviously, I think that just the, the line of scrimmage. I thought we would be better at the line of scrimmage, both offensively and defensively. And I, I knew Texas was good. I didn't know that they were going to be that good. Um, but it was pretty impressive. Uh, how they pretty much handled things. And, you know, they didn't run for a whole lot of yards, but by gosh, when they had to just lay the hammer down and just paper cut you and run out the clock, they did it, you know, two yards in a cloud of dust, and they got it done. And that that kind of takes your man. And I was surprised, a little surprised by that, but um, I was a little surprised by it. I thought they would have more, like, design quarterback run. I mean, they ran a couple draws, they, and there was a couple – little, you know, read that where Milrow should have handed the ball off, but he didn't. He kept it, and that didn't help. But there wasn't a whole lot of, it looked like design quarterback plays. I, it didn't seem that way to me. Run. And, I mean, if they talk about that's one of Milrow's strengths is his running ability, you thought they'd have had a few more design running plays. But that's kind of what surprised me a little bit more. But I, I thought the receivers played well. you got to get them the ball. But both those guys did good, um, you know. But like I said, I think the line of scrimmage kind of surprised me a little bit. But And at the end of the day, I know Alabama lost by 10, and everybody talked about saving double digits. I mean, it's literally one point in the double digits. You know, double digits could go all the way to 99, you know. <laughs> so, they try to, you know, they paint the fish like, oh, double digits. Well, it's 10 points. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, it's not what we're accustomed to or used to or saving these accustomed to or used to, but it's not like, you know, it, 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 we didn't get blown out, but I think the thing that's bad is, the battle the line of scrimmage and then once Alabama went ahead you know usually teams fold and Texas man they didn't fold they answered back with a haymaker and uh I kind of, I think that kind of surprised Alabama a little bit and we didn't really respond well after that and that's kind of what surprised me a little bit Roger uh much was made out of uh, Alabama having three offensive line and at 350 can you be too big? Because these guys have good well, feet too. I, I, that, well, that's that the, confuses hey, well, me. No, that's the first thing. Look, that's the first thing I said last in the Middle Tennessee game. I said they're way too big. Why in the world are they? Look at the NFL. The NFL guys are not that. They're lean. You know, they're. I mean, you can't. I mean, I think McLaughlin's a good center, but I think he's got to put on who. They'll get that weight. I think they'll get that weight off of that, that, as the season progresses. I think you'll see them getting a little bit better shape. But I mean, first of all, Caden Proctor is just a big dude. I mean, that is a big guy. But you know, they talk about uh, Otis, right? Who started off at four fifteen or four eighteen, and now he's down to three oh eight. 
look how he's playing. I mean, he's really moving around. And uh, But, yeah, sometimes I think you get too big. I mean, and I definitely think that was the case. Uh, that's what I said after the first week. I did, before the Texas game, that was all I was saying. I was like, man, they're just too fat. And everybody goes, oh, no, look how they dominated. And I go, well, pump the brakes, middle Tennessee. And secondly, they're way too heavy. I mean, you know, and it, I think that does make a difference. But they'll – they. That's an easy fix. They can lose. They'll, you know, they can get down. Um, you know, if it was all good weight, that's different. You know, if it's all muscle weight, that's a different thing. But I don't think it was all muscle weight. Roger, we have uh, we've been talking about this uh, quite a bit this week, uh, mainly because this uh, death of the dynasty narrative has been uh, prominent in the national media this week um but the thing is that if, if you just look at the at the raw statistics you know there's some troubling trends uh, in alabama's last 19 games against power five opponents they've lost five times and you look at the previous 50 games against those same power five opponents alabama's lost uh, uh they, they've lost five times so they've lost as many games to Power Five in the last 19 games as the previous 50. Uh, do you have a, an opinion as to uh, a, a what's going on with the program and, and just uh, big picture wise? And, uh, you know, uh, is there a, a reason for uh, the fact that Alabama has, you know, it, it clearly come back down from being just head and shoulders the preeminent program in college football? Well, I, I mean, obviously it's hard to uh, it's, it's hard to maintain. And every coach, that, you know, wins a national championship, goes on. Look, I don't think the dynasty said. I do. I understand the trend. And sometimes it's a little frustrating, but but I think what's happened is they they've recruited at a high level, but those are rankings, right? You got to be able to develop players. Some of it might fall on, and Saban's had to replace a bunch of coaches, and maybe you know maybe he doesn't have the you know the best coaches in the world. I don't I don't maybe that's part of it. maybe they're not developing guys like they used to develop guys, and, and maybe that's a part of it. But you know Saban. It's eventually going to catch up when you keep losing coaches, keep losing coaches, got to keep replacing coaches, and then now you get all these kids that like you get to get in the transfer portal that aren't starting and want to play and go somewhere else to play, and now all of a sudden that hurts your depth, right? Now you have both the guys that, you know, that's the one thing Saban always bragged about is like, you know, the hardest competitions in practice, you know, between the ones and twos, they're fighting for their position. Well, now I don't necessarily know they got that. I don't think that, you know you kind of got you kind of going with what you got. Because I, I would think that they would replace some of those, I mean, a couple of them offensive linemen. They kept the same group in there the whole time. But, um, like I said, I don't know. I don't. I still don't think the dynasty's dead. I think once Saban's there, I think just I think everybody just needs to pump their brakes. I think we ran into a pretty good Texas team uh, that's done things, you know, kind of, you know, Stark's kind of moved them in the right direction. But, yeah, I mean, those are some trends that I guess you got to keep looking at. But, I mean, they were going to step back a little bit, but they're still elite. They still got great players. They still got a good roster. There's not a coach in the country that wouldn't probably trade spots with Saban. Um, you know, maybe except for, you know, Kirby Smart, I guess what Norvell's doing down in Florida State, but I think everybody would trade with, with, uh, Saban with the talent that he's got. But, but I think it might be a time to get a new, you know, maybe if you don't buy into Saban's offense, you got to have an offense before they do his own offense. Hey, Roger, uh, I'm not out of questions, and neither is Lars. Are you out of time? Can you hang on another 10 minutes? Yeah, if you're okay, if you can hear me, I'm on the road traveling, so I'm good as long as you're good. No, um, you sound great, and we'll continue to sound great. On the other side of this break, as you listen to Big Noon Sport. Laura Lee Thompson is known as the Bama Broker. She's a Tuscaloosa native, an Alabama graduate, and the only realtor in town with Wall Street experience. A skilled negotiator, Laura Lee knows how to buy low and sell high. And the Bama Broker isn't just going to show you houses. No, Laura Lee is going to educate you on the market, guide you to homes that fit your budget, and teach you how to sell your home for its maximum profit. 
Throughout the entire process, the Bama broker will equip you with the tools you need to both buy a home and build financial wealth through home ownership. Trust me, the Bama broker who's as roll-tied as houndstooth, will get you across the goal line. That's Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama broker with Advantage Realty Group. You can reach her at 205-790-7229. Again, that's 205-790-7229. And you can also email her at Laura Lee at the com. That's Laura Lee at the com. Covering SEC sports like Kudzu on the roadside. This is Big Noon Sports. Our guest is Roger Schultz. Roger, I wanted to ask you this when we were talking about lineman size. What, what was your play and weight? Two sixty. So these guys are weighing one hundred pounds more than you. <laughs> yeah. I, I guarantee you they weren't a hundred pounds stronger than me in the bench pressure of the squad. I can promise you that. But I can it move a little seems, bit better than they could. It seems uh incredible the size and I keep thinking it's gonna peak out, but they just keep getting bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger. Hey, you made comment uh, about Alabama's defensive line versus Texas. Could could you expand on that just a little bit? Because uh, they kind of got whooped, too. Yeah, no, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's like, where was the pass rush? Where was the pressure? I don't know. Malachi Moore said something about maybe we ought to blitz for it. You know, they neutralized Dallas Turner. Those, I'm telling you, man, those tackles, you go back and watch that film, those tackles for Texas are are really, really good. I mean, Really good. So, because, I mean, even, you know, when Will Anderson was doing well, that opened up for Dallas Turner. So, if Dallas Turner's getting blocked, double team or chip, there's got to be somebody available, right? I mean, I was just kind of surprised by the the defensive line. You know, I just, it's a line of scrimmage game, but tech, I get, you know, tech credit building that offensive line, and they've done a, you know, they got a couple new guys in there, but those, those tackles played really, really well. Roger, the uh, the sky hasn't fallen yet on Alabama's season. Uh, everything they want to accomplish is still uh, very much within their grasp. Uh, all they need to do now is win out. They don't have any more uh, margin for error. But so this weekend, traveling to uh, South Florida, which is a really odd place to be going to for this Alabama team, but. Do you, do you, is going on the road almost good medicine for a team that uh, has just suffered a, a really difficult home loss? Just uh, just for the basic uh, things like uh, bonding with one another and, you know, uh, getting on the plane and, and just spending a lot of time with one another uh, as, as teammates. Yeah, well, I think what they need to do, I think they all just need to get in a fist fight, get mad. Play a little bit <laughs> off. That might help, but uh, no, uh, no. I think it's a good thing to get kind of get out. And I mean, and South Florida's not a very good team. I know they beat. I mean, Western Kentucky beat them, and then they lost. Uh, then they beat Florida A and M, and I mean, they only beat Florida A and M by ten points or some. I mean, not very fourteen points. I think it. Was, so it. Uh, no, it's a, it's a good it's a good game to kind of get everybody right. You see what happens. See what kind of adjustments we make. Because all those things. I mean, I know everybody wants to panic and not everybody. You know, I mean. The, ri- the rivers are full of Bama fans, and they're all jumping off the bridge. But they, you know, but it's not panic. I still I, in Saban. I still trust they're going to do. They're going to fix it. And I mean, he's won a bunch of national championships with one loss. Uh, I mean, every. I mean, so let's. I, I wouldn't push the panic button just yet. Uh, you know, obviously you want to see marked improvement. You want to see things just get a little bit better in the, the South Florida game, which they should. It's going to be interesting, too, what they do at the quarterback position. You know, is Milrose still the guy, or is, the, is Tyler Buckner going to be the guy, or Ty Simpson? Who's, you know, who's the who's the guy? I mean, so, I mean, obviously, I think probably a couple of the quarterbacks will play this this weekend, and uh, but it'll be it'll be interesting. But everything everything's fixed. Well, obviously, we need to be a nice to have a nice dominating win. I mean, if we beat South Florida by you know seven points, that might be, <laughs> you know. Uh, crank up the suicide hotline, but um, but I think we'll be all right. Roger, 
I'm going to dive away from this. Let's talk about something fun. We're talking about flights, team flights, charter flights. What are their, um, probably 100 people in the, in the traveling entourage, something like that. That's really not my point. What do they feed you when you're on a long flight? Uh, well, you uh, when you go to see your seat, you sit down. They've already got like you got like a couple sandwiches, a candy bar, chips, a cookie, and it's in a bag sitting in the seat. So that's basically it. You know, you got to you know you get they don't they don't they'll let you drink a whole lot of Coke or anything like that. You got to drink Gatorade or water. But uh, but that's what they. I mean, it's nothing fancy. I mean, it's just a, a pre, you know they'll either give you a, a you know it, it was always sitting in our seat and. Uh, it was it was like always a couple sandwiches and uh, always a, for butter for some reason Butterfinger I don't know why Butterfinger was always in there but a Butterfinger um, but that's what we uh, we always had and I mean if it was a longer flight I don't recall I mean I know we had a snack and maybe you had you know maybe they told you I can't remember it's not like they go down the aisle and go hey would you like to purchase a, some peanuts I mean that that, that doesn't happen but. Uh, Roger, guys, I can't remember. I can't remember on long flight. You know, we went to Phoenix, but I can't remember. I know they they gave us food to start. I don't know if they gave us something in the middle or. Heck, I don't remember. Um, Roger, if if you're at a dinner party and uh, somebody asks you, "Hey, tell us your favorite uh, travel story." Whether it was like a, a prank that somebody played or just, uh, you know, somebody who maybe was terrified of flying. Uh, do you have one in your arsenal, an anecdote that you, uh, that you can whip out? Well, I know we, it, it was always fun to take the first flight with freshmen that have never been on flight. That was always fun. Cause you know, we always make fun of them and we go, ah, you know, there was always that. So the guy that had never flown, you know, there's always, that guy was always going to get picked on. It didn't matter, you know. And there's always one or two at the first of the season. But I tell you, I tell you, the, uh, a flight, a thing that we, not a very good thing, but uh, some one or two guys would always have a little bottle of liquor. But when we fly back, you know, we would we would be enjoying the, uh, you know, a little uh, alcoholic drink on the plane. But hopefully, coaches wouldn't walk back and want to see us. But um, that was always fun, you know. I mean, uh, to have take take uh, a part in the spirits. And by the time we got landed in Tuscaloosa, we were we'd already done our uh, pre gaming and we were ready to go. So uh, who that was, was the always coach? Uh, yeah. Who was so the head coach? We ready coach? to go? You... Uh, it was all the head coaches. Uh, yeah, because you played you, under three. Is under that right? three? Yeah, yeah. Perkins, uh, Perkins, Curry, and Stalling. You know, and uh, they they kind of yeah it started smelling like Bourbon Street. You know, on some flights. <laughs> like, wow. You're like, good God! I said, guy. You know, I now look. I did not participate in that. By the way, I did not at all. And I got guys. Can y'all just pump the brakes a little bit on it? But no. But that's all. We always have to make fun of the new guy. Uh, Roger, it's uh, it's always a blast. Roll Tide, appreciate you joining us. And uh, let's do it again in a week or so, all right? Yeah, we'll do it. Hey, guys, hey Bama fans, man, we're going to be all right. Just, we're going to be all right. So. The voice of wisdom from the one and only Roger Schultz. Thank you, Roger. We'll be back and conclude the first hour of Big Noon Sports. Coming up, Coming up on The Game with Ryan Fowler. Coming up on the Thursday edition of The Game, we'll feature Rodney Orr, TiterInsider.com, Bruce Marshall, Vegas Handicapper, Brad Powers, BradPowersSports.com, and we will continue our Dreamland School Prediction Day here on The Game, starting at 2 on Tide 100.9. The home of Alabama Crimson Tide Sports. The longest running sports program in Tuscaloosa. The game with Ryan Fowler. Weekdays from 2 to 6 p.m. on Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app.
Don't hide 100.9 Tuscaloosa weather. Just a small chance of a shower this afternoon, otherwise partially sunny, the high 85. Tonight, fair with a low at 66. Or tomorrow and Saturday, a mix of sun and clouds both days with scattered showers around. Highs between 84 and 87. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 78 degrees in Tuscaloosa. The best sports talk in Alabama. This is Big Noon Sports. Tim Brando will join. One mention, and then I'm going to give you some picks for this weekend, and everybody needs to lock this in because I am a solid 4-4 four and four against the spread this year. <laughs> um, quote from Aaron Rodgers, I shall rise yet again. <laughs> that sounds very Cal Berkeley to me. Yeah, but like I believe Phoenix. it. I yeah. don't think he's going to uh he's not gonna go out that way. And and you agree, don't you? Uh yeah. I think he's gonna try to come back. Gotta remember well, that there was all of one team that was interested in Aaron Rodgers in this offseason, and that was the Jets. No other team wanted to uh, deal with the Packers when it came to Aaron Rodgers, maybe because the asking price was so high. And by the way, that asking price, we all thought it was going to be a first-round pick next year, but Aaron had to play in 70% of the snaps for the Packers to get that first-round pick, and now he's not going to do that. That goes to a second-round pick. So, um, you know, it's going to be a 40 year old quarterback coming off a significant, significant injury. Again, uh, playing with an offensive line that as we saw on uh, Monday night is, uh, really got a lot of work to do. Who knows what they'll look like next year, but you know, of course he's going to say that. He's not going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm throwing in the towel. I'm retiring. I mean, of course he's going to come out and, you know, uh, imply, not say directly, but imply that he's going to come back. I just, I know personally the, the, the grueling rehab that he's about ready to face. And I get it. His situation is a lot different than mine, but, uh, fortunately when I was rehabbing, I had a lot of free time. And so I was, I was doing three hours a day over at Andrews in, in the rehab clinic. And I'm still not a hundred percent like six years later, nor will I ever be. But it, it, and it, it just it just changes you uh, in in not the best way in your athleticism and your uh, just your abilities and your quickness and you know there's a lot that goes into it and uh, I, I I'm not I'm not sold on him coming back. Um, We'll see. Okay. Well, let's, let's dig into, uh, the games that, that Reagan and, uh, you and I are picking this week. And since you got to run, we'll just get your pick. Uh, all right. Tennessee at Florida. Tennessee is a 6.5 favorite. Florida hadn't shown me enough to think they can cover. Uh, it's at home. It's all that. I like Billy Napier. Uh, but I, I'm taking, I'm taking Tennessee. It's what did what did you say? Six. I got six, six and a half. Life. All yeah. right, six and, six and, oh, and a half. Big, uh, I'm taking Tennessee. Joe okay. Milton. Whoa. Yeah, he's he's a, he's an NFL player. Okay, uh, Georgia is hosting South Carolina, and Georgia is a twenty-seven and a half point home favorite. And that seems so steep to me. Uh, Georgia hadn't been full throttle for the first couple of games, but, you know, they don't have to play full throttle as good and as deep and well coached as they are. And, um, actually, Lars, I, th- I think South Carolina might have been just a little bit of a disappointment. Yeah. Uh, but that's just too much. Um, this is an SEC game. I realize that, uh, it is in Athens, but I'll take South Carolina just because. You like their coach. Yeah, uh, no, I'm going to be with you on that one. Um, also, uh, Carson Beck has looked really good yeah. in, my, in my view uh, for Georgia. Uh, and like I said, I know Stetson Bennett won back-to-back national titles, but they may have upgraded at the quarterback position. He made All some right. corner throws uh, oh, in the God. last couple of games. That this, I just thought, uh, you know, that's NFL. That's one. NFL, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, LSU at Mississippi State. LSU is a nine and a half point favorite. That's a that's an interesting game, but I'll tell you what, I'm not going to sit here and claim that I have watched every single snap of Mississippi State. I've seen some of them. They have won a couple of games, but they have had to rely on penalties and turnovers and, and mistakes by the other team, particularly in the Arizona game, to win those games. Um, I'm going with the Bengal Tigers of Louisiana State University. Yeah, I think I'm going to be with you on that one, too. All right, uh, the final pick is uh, Alabama at South Florida. Alabama, the latest I've seen, they're 33-point favorites. All right. I'm kind of checking through mine here to see what they say, and I thought it was 33 or something like that. Yeah, 33. I've got is what 33. I see. Okay. Um, South Florida isn't as good as Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, as Rogers stated, um, they struggled with the Rattlers of Florida A&M. Plus, Alabama is in rebound, punch out mode. Um, I'm taking the Crimson Tide, 54 10. Yeah. Um, Okay, I'll give my thoughts on that too yeah, later. Yeah, but, talk to um, Reagan about that. But I did see that, um, you know, Nick Saban is doing a weekly segment with Pat McAfee that on the Pat McAfee weird show. Yeah, do you, do you get any, I mean, a lot of people have looked into this. Uh, who have, uh, or a lot of people have speculated that, hey, it's, it, it's Nick Saban, you know, just getting ready for his post coaching career and, and, uh, playing footsie with the media and, and going on this new really high profile show. Um, I don't necessarily buy that, but, uh, one interesting thing he said, and this was just, a, a maybe an hour or so ago, that he felt that his team uh, played with, uh, quote, too much uh, anxiety. And anxiety is the quote. And that's a that's a word that he has used quite a bit in the last two years. And, um, you know, he, he thinks that uh, it, it's very simple, that they've deviated from the process. They're not focusing on each play, on their assignment on each play. They're too worried about outcome. And, uh, and once you worry about outcome and the bigger picture, that's when you start to make mental errors. You make mental errors that causes anxiety. Anxiety causes you to make more mental errors and it's a snowball effect. Um, I think that, 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 it, to, that to me is very sort of cogent, insightful analysis from, from Coach Saban and very, very honest about what happened on Saturday night in Brian Denny. Why would he agree to do that? I, I, I don't puzzling. know. It seems like those two just don't match up culturally. And I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I know that his podcast. It's is a really big. Popular, it's a big. It's a big. It's a very big platform. Yeah, it's, and, it's a large audience. And, and, and just, uh, a lot of uh, younger people uh, really uh, love Pat McAfee, and, and that's so, why he's on sports. That's why he's on uh, Game Day, right? Yeah, I, I think he's crude. But you know, that's my generation. Yeah. The younger generations, you know, they like the in-your-face stuff. Guy wears a muscle shirt to do game day, huh? Well, Ju Justin, what, what do you think of that? Pat McAfee? Justin, That's a good question. Yeah, Justin, what do you think of Pat McAfee? I like Pat McAfee. I think he's yeah. I think he's funny. I enjoy it. Yep. Yeah, I do too. It was That's awesome when he uh, when he got bombs on when game he got, day. Did you see him like get the Alabama crowd all going when he was yelling "Alla" and they all yelled "Bama" and he did the roll? Oh, yeah. it was cool. It was a cool. I, and moment. I was there uh, that that morning when game day started on Saturday, and he was doing it then too. It was great. Yeah, it was uh, it's a cultural he, thing. Then. He had the he had the he had the crowd in the palm of his hand. That's and cool. I'll yeah. say I'll say Matt he he wears a muscle shirt for his show, but he does put on a suit and stuff for game day. Oh, I, I saw him on the set doing something in one. Maybe it was a warm up or a pre game to the pre game yeah, to the pre game. They, they did his show on the yeah. game day set on but, Friday. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a cultural thing. My generation doesn't like that kind of stuff. And of course, you know, I throw kids out of my front yard daily. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm kidding so much. Uh, but I do think, and you spot on, Lars, for asking somebody 
you know, of the immediate generation. What do they call you guys, Justin? Are you Generation C or X or D? Or- I'm Generation X. You are, are you, Justin? Okay. Yeah. I, I think I... I don't You're think a I'm a Gen Z. I think I'm a millennial. I, I'm huh? 2000, baby, so I don't know. Oh, I think you're below. Uh, millennials are older than you, I think. But, Gosh, man. so you were one at 9-11. I'm a baby boomer. Jeez. Proud of it. All right. Uh, Tim Brando is coming up next on Big Noon Sports. A Town Square Media Station, WTUG HD2 Northport, and W265CG Tuscaloosa, Tide 100.9, and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. From T-Town to the Plains, this is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. Welcome back in to Hour 2, Big Noon Sports. We have the one and the only Timmy B, Tim Brando. How are you doing today, my friend? Wonderful, Lars. Good to be with you. How uh, Give us your experience last week and uh, in, uh, any fun travel stories. <laughs> well, uh, USC is, uh, has really improved defensively. That's bad news for everybody that's got them on their schedule coming up. Uh, they've got a defensive front now, uh, one particular player that was very impressive, which enables their linebackers to make some great plays, and they did. Stanford was outmanned and outclassed, so you could say that uh, we still have some questions about just how good they are, and we may not know until, you know, they, they, they do play Arizona State in a couple, uh, well, I'll say a couple of weeks, a week, a week from Saturday at Arizona State, which will be somewhat of a test. Turns out that is the game that uh, Spencer and I will have uh, among uh, back-to-back affairs. Um, Fox has us headed to uh, Purdue for Wisconsin on Friday night. Then we're going to fly overnight to the desert and do a little Pac-12 after dark again uh, a week from Saturday. So two games for us next week. Um, but USC, when they get to that point where they play, say, Colorado, oh, my God, I can't even tell you how – how crazy that game might be uh, with with I think right now the the two hottest quarterbacks in the country, uh, Deion Sun Shador and and uh, Caleb Williams. They are, uh, I mean, they're fantastic players. So that could be an incredible game coming up. But I was impressed by what I saw. My travel actually went very smoothly. So uh, I'm happy to report that uh, uh, I was able to get home in pretty good shape and. Uh, I'm ready to hit the road uh, this week. A little bit of a home home feel to this one, only having to drive about three and a half hours to, to Houston, which I'll do shortly after I get off the phone with you. Do you prefer that, just being able to drive and sort of be in oh, yeah. control of your own destiny rather than getting <laughs> oh, on yeah. an airplane? <laughs> Any opportunity I have to drive, I'll do it. Uh, if it's nine hours or, or fewer, it's an automatic. Oh, uh, once you get into that double... Once yeah, you get into that double-digit hour my, thing, uh, my magic number was always about six, six and a half. Yeah, but, no, uh, no. I, I'm I'm a guy that grew up traveling with my dad and his band, and we used to drive, my goodness, all over the place um, in those days with a with a couple of um, a vans with a with musicians. So <laughs> I I was sort of raised on uh, getting in a as Chris Farley coined the phrase a van down by the river. Mm-hmm. And keep on going, you know, when I was a child. So I, I love it. I find it cathartic. Turn on uh, Sirius XM and if I'm in the mood to listen to, to some sports. I will. If I'm in the mood, uh, mood to hear some great music, I'll, I'll do that. So, uh, and of course, anytime I'm this close to home, I could take my wife with me. Um, you know, we're empty nesters with grandkids now, so she gets to come with me, and that's always fun. So your dad was a performer. Did that uh kind of in, in inspire you to want to be on the public oh. stage so to speak I don't remember not being in front of people I mean he put me on a stage with uh, Brando and the Dreamers when I was 5 years old I was on television when I was 5 years old um part of the act you know singing with my dad my my sister was uh pantomiming Teresa Brewer songs and dancing 
uh, jazz dancing uh, with the band. We were a four show band, and we toured SAC air bases all across the globe. And um, you know, we got on airplanes and flew. You know, I was looking at the uh, path of this hurricane that's headed to Bermuda. We we played the St. George Hotel in Bermuda uh, when I was seven years old. I'll never forget watching um, the sun rise uh, over uh, a gazebo in the front of the St. George's Hotel while uh, my father's band and I was a part of it were still up uh, playing music uh, long after the set was supposed to be over. So, you know, SAC air bases were always located at these locations in places like um, Harmon, Newfoundland, and Goose Bay, Labrador, uh, the Azor Islands, which is where uh, my family is from. I'm of Portuguese descent. So, yeah, I was seeing the world. It was a little bit like uh, being an Air Force brat. Uh, you know, you hear stories about kids that grew up with fathers that were in the military. Uh, until I was about 10 years old, between, you know, birth and age 10 or 11, uh, that's the kind of life I was leading. And then all of a sudden, Dad got out of it, and uh, and I had to be a sort of a normal kid. And it really was a good time to become a normal kid, <laughs> playing sports. And But, you know, my dreams of being in front of people and, and being um, a broadcaster were always cemented. I always knew that's what I wanted to do. That's really interesting. Um, so... So even at like eight, nine years old, you knew in a sense of what you wanted to do. And I asked that because my, my son is eight and uh, I, I'm just wondering if, if, if things are percolating in his head about, you know, hey, uh, you know, seeing my dad do this or my mom do this, like, you know, this could really be something I want to do. And just the, mm-hmm. the influence that your, that your dad had on you and, and that sort of lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh... The world was uh, the world was uh, to be conquered. You know that was the feeling I had. And uh, at a time when you know most uh, kids that grew up with fathers of the World War II generation that you know had a hard had a hard time telling their kids how much they loved them. My dad was just the opposite. He 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 was very encouraging. Um, you know he was telling people on the bandstand, "Here's the." Most, you know, the, the, the audience, uh, after I came out and did this little com- comedic bit to, to join him on stage, uh, wearing a tuxedo that matched his and the rest of the bands. I mean, I looked like a, a midget, you know, a band member is what I looked like. That was sort of part of the act. And, uh, I mean, I, I, after we got done, he put me on the drums and dad would say, there's the best six year old drummer in the world. And I believed it. You know, and, uh, and, and so you can be the best, uh, at anything you do. That's, that's, that's what he preached. And, uh, he said, I told him I didn't want to do what he did. I, I, I was enamored with guys like Kurt Gowdy and Ray Scott and, um, Jim Simpson and Chris Schenkel and all these great broadcasters doing college football, Keith Jackson. And I, 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 I told him that's what I want to do. And he said, well, you start. Um, you start concentrating on just that and you can be the best. And so, you, think, uh, you know, we... This is, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, we worked a high school football game together in 1971. I was 14, had not, had not turned 15 yet. And, um, you know, Dad told me after the first game, he said, you're the, you're the best 14-year-old broadcaster probably in the world. And he said, um, so your goal should be to be the best you can be, to be, be the best there is of your generation when you're 44, you know, and 54. <laughs> and, 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 you know, that kind of encouragement uh, was something I took with me through all the ups and downs, and you're going to have them. Everybody's going to have a roller coaster ride in life, things that you don't have control over. Uh, but I was, um, I was able to maintain, I think, a level of confidence through whatever difficult times were going to be there because of the way I was raised. You know, I talk to my students a lot about um, about rhythm and cadence and, uh, and and beats in your writing. And the fact that you developed a musical ear at a young age, do you think that helped you with uh, your yeah. uh, your kind of yeah. projection and, and just your 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 speech pattern as a as a broadcaster? Yeah, I, I think, and one of the great compliments that Spencer and I get. Uh, from, you know, not, not just, not, you know, it's always wonderful to hear from the fans. I mean, it is, 
especially those that are objective, uh, maybe don't have a, a dog in the hunt with the game, but they're just listening to the game and watching the game objectively. Um, I'll hear from them, but I also hear from my peers uh, that they're they're envious of the chemistry that, that Spencer Tillman and I have. And, you know, that's a magical thing. And it, do, it, it doesn't always happen uh, quite that easily, but once it does and and you two uh, are on the same page and are sort of four eyes with one brain you know fused together the two brains fused together um, you develop a chemistry and I think a lot of that chemistry comes from knowing one another's cadence one another's rhythm and that that's what brings a, a great rhythm to a show uh, Spencer is an incredibly talented guy that's far deeper in thought than I'll ever be. Uh, he's nine years my junior. I feel as though he's not only my age, but maybe a little older when it comes to life wisdom. And um, But together, while we're on the air, man, we are having the time of our lives. I mean, we're really having fun. And I think that most people, not all, but most people, really enjoy uh, listening to people that they know are enjoying themselves while they're doing whatever they're doing. Uh, so many people don't, you know, and... Um, it stands out to people when they see people that really do enjoy one another's company. And a lot of that has to do with just, as you said, rhythm. And uh, there's rhythm to a golf swing. There's rhythm to a broadcast, you know. And uh, I think we've got it. I do. Can you stick around for one more segment? And uh, we'll actually talk about some college football. But I, I love I love talking to you about your background. And uh, I just I, I so enjoy getting the secrets of, of very successful people and this has been uh, very enlightening can you stick around timmy yeah yeah all right great all right uh listening to big noon sports we'll be right back join tide tide 100.9 tuscaloosa weather just a small chance of a shower this afternoon otherwise partially sunny the high 85 tonight fair with a low at 66 or tomorrow and saturday a mix of sun and clouds both days with scattered showers around highs between 84 and 87 i'm james Spann on the abc 3340 weather center on tide 100.9 it's 78 degrees in tuscaloosa from t-town to the plains this is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. All right, welcome back in. We're talking to Tim Brando. All right, Tim, let's start with uh, Alabama, Texas. Uh, your big takeaways from that game and, uh, you know, the, the national narrative that has emerged is that uh, the dynasty is uh, almost officially over in Tuscaloosa. That's completely, that's completely wrong. Uh, I mean, it is completely wrong. I was more impressed with Texas than I was depressed with Alabama. I, I thought Texas um, physically handled them. I understand why there's concern, Lars, uh, especially among that fan base. And, and knowing as much as I do about the fan base, I'm not surprised. Uh, and by the way, it's, it's no different, really, only it, it's uh, enhanced a little bit more, I think, maybe in Alabama than it is in Louisiana. Louisianians are just as nuts about LSU. And when they when they lose the way they lost, that first game to uh, Florida State. I mean, they're just they're ready to jump, jump off the Mississippi River Bridge, and I. <laughs> that's just the nature of the beast. Alabama fans, I think, are even worse when it comes to that. And and that isn't. To, I'm not speaking disparagingly. I'm just pointing out there's that much passion. There's there's that much uh, that they expect all the time, regardless. And um, and they're angry, and they feel. That that um, that they that they have been wronged. I mean, they they take it that seriously. So uh, you hear that, and uh, I'm gonna go, I'll go ahead and give him a uh, a little pop here. I mean, Paul Paul has a show on that that uh, is is pretty much seventy five percent, eighty percent Alabama based in in calls, and when and when they're angry, the world gets to hear it. And I think sometimes a lot of media that are maybe just sort of driving by and maybe listening to to that show on the SEC network, they sort of run with it uh, to some extent. 
knowing how upset the fan base is. The, the real truth about this team is that uh, it, it just simply was not going to be as good as it's been in past years because of the mission critical position. You know, you've had a tremendous run of quarterbacks there. Uh, I mean, a tremendous run. And and now you're asking uh, an offense to, to be as uh, as dynamic as it's been in the past with, by and large, a one-dimensional running quarterback, uh, Milrow. He's he's very talented at what he does, but he's not, he, he has not developed into suddenly a great drop-back passer, which was much of what we were seeing in that game. I was a little surprised that they didn't roll him out more, that they didn't use him as uh, both a run-pass threat uh, more in the offense. So if it, someone wants to be critical of the direction of the offense, uh, I can see that to some extent uh, because he's simply, you know, not ready to do exactly that. But uh, to some extent, people just have to come to terms with the fact, uh, and I think maybe even Nick Saban has to answer at some point. Somebody has the courage to ask him. Uh, <laughs> I, I did notice today I was uh, taking my shower, and I noticed he was on with uh, McAfee today, and he's going to be a regular, according to Pat on his show. I wonder if the question will ever come. I, I didn't hear it today. Uh, if the question will ever come, Nick, do you think you made a mistake not going back into the, the transfer portal a little bit more quickly this year? Uh, because he clearly dropped the ball there. Uh, if what we were, if what we were told and what was reported is true that Drake may turned him down and they were coming with some serious NIO money, he should have gone back in and, and gone and gotten some of these guys that we see like the kid, for instance, at Duke, who's an outstanding quarterback and has clearly uh, the, the first skill that he has is running, but he's also developing a, a pretty good skill set at throwing the ball. Um, that hasn't happened yet. And if Buckner was all he was able to get and Buckner couldn't start at Notre Dame, he obviously didn't start the first part of the season at Alabama. I think we may see him some this week at South Florida, but that's that's the issue here. Um the defense is, is not bad. I mean, I thought they played pretty well against a Texas offense with a lot of skill. You know, their receiving core is outstanding, and, and yours is one of the top quarterbacks in the country. So I thought they hung in there pretty good. Um, I was surprised that Texas was the more physical team up front. That was startling to me, uh, that their, their defensive line just trashed Alabama's offensive line. In the passing game, uh, Milrow was under duress the whole game. Uh, and I thought his escapability kind of kept Alabama in it. But trashing that kid and trashing the entire team, though, no, I think Alabama played uh, a heck of a football team, one that I, I really undervalued coming in. I was wrong about Texas, just as I was wrong about USC. I think USC's got a much better defense. I think Texas uh, has a much better defense. We'll see if they can hold it together. You know, how does... How does Sark handle some success? How does his team handle a full cup of success? We'll see. But I have no doubt that Alabama is still fine, and I don't see Nick leaving anytime soon. Um, and But at some point, he's got to answer a few critics. You know, he this, this notion that every time he comes on, he's got to be called the GOAT ten times by the interviewer for him to be satisfied to answer questions. I mean, that's... That's um, that's a bit much. I, I, I think people ought to be able to ask some tough questions. When he gets some of them uh, it, it, locally, he he he's he, he's not nearly as happy with a smile on his face as he was today with McAfee. I, although I don't know, maybe he's getting a check from Pat. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was a odd decision um, to go uh, on and be a regular guest, have a weekly appearance on McAfee's show, but. Then you get inside of Nick Saban's brain and every decision is made for what? Recruiting. And so perhaps he can yeah, reach a, a yeah. younger audience. Well, you know, with, with it, you're right. It, it's a little like uh, uh, Joe Biden, right? Going on with, with um, you know, uh, the guy on CBS at late night or the oh, right, or, yeah. or Jimmy Kimmel. You know what I mean? I mean, it, uh, that's where their, their people want to put him so he can be protected in a younger audience which they're hoping to win with. I mean, it's the same kind of decision. It's a political decision for someone that is uh, considered the greatest of, of all time. 
and and Nick is worthy of that. I'm not saying he's not, but week to week, you know, he's got to answer the bell just like any other head football coach. Um, let's just uh, kind of go around the country. Uh, ACC is uh, Florida State clearly the the class of that uh, that league right now. Looks that way, uh, but but I mean I'm I'm holding out on Duke here. That might be a fun uh, matchup. I mean, well, I think about um, Clemson. Uh, we can be critical of Nick not going to the portal some. But, I mean, Dabo Sweeney hasn't gone there at all. And Dabo was, I think you could say, after Deshaun Watson uh, pulled off that win against Alabama in their return engagement in the national championship, Dabo was, um, you know, he was he was the Deion Sanders of that season and, and seasons that followed that. You know, he created a culture of fun, you know, at Clemson. Well, now, um, you know, that that has worn a bit thin. And even though you recruit well, and you know, and he does recruit well, he hasn't recruited like Georgia. Kirby Smart can afford to build uh, from within and go nothing with nothing but high school players that are four and five stars because he's proven he can win that way, and that he's constantly developing the talent stars. But but Dabo just saying no to the the portal altogether, and that is a mistake. You know, they, 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 they've had issues at quarterback too. You know, that's obvious. You know, I, I, I wrote a book on Dabo Sweeney called Dabo's World and, uh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't see this coming. What, what do you think are the, the main issues with Clemson right now? Well, that's the, that's the primary one that they, they need to understand that no matter how good you may think you are from season to season in the, the world of the portal and NIL, and they've got a good NIL program. They got a great one. Okay, there's no reason not to at least look in the portal from time to time. Uh, I just think it's a little old school. And and Dabo, I, I'm sure. I mean, you know him as well as I do. Maybe better. You you wrote a book on him. I I think he, he fashions himself as a purist, uh, but a CEO uh, football coach. So he needs. His offensive and defensive coordinator to be right in lockstep with him. He's made some changes there too, okay, and and at, on both sides of the ball. And uh, when you make those changes, then your your player development uh, can suffer to some extent. Uh, I think that's happened a little bit with Alabama uh, because of all the changes in coordinators that they've had. Dabo's now going through that really for the first time in his career uh, after having you know a group of guys that have been with him on both sides of the ball for a long, long time. And he, he, he was paying them very well and they were, uh, they were obligated to him and they loved working there. He still has a fun environment. I mean, he, he still has a culture of positivity, but I think that, um, until you're recruiting with the top recruiting class like Georgia every year, I still think you have to be able to go into the, the transfer portal. Um, Clemson doesn't have enough big games to play in the ACC to capture the imagination also of the country every week. Okay, uh, much more, I mean, less room for error for him. Okay, you drop a game like that one to Duke and, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the hill you got to climb is a lot longer and steeper than the one Alabama has to climb playing in the SEC. Um, let's shift over to the Big Ten. One team that's caught my my eye is Penn State. Uh, just your, your thoughts on how you think the Big Ten is going to shake out based on what you've seen so far. Well, we'll, we'll know a lot more about where Penn State is this week. Uh, that's a big noon game that they have with Illinois. Now, Illinois spit the bit at Kansas. That's a good Kansas team. You don't want to play them in Lawrence. Um, I mean, they, they were... They were uh, America's darling for the first six weeks last year, and I think that they may still be surprising people this year. But but Bielema does have a good team, and um, that game's in Champaign. Uh, their fan base is pumped up. Uh, Penn State will have to bring it in this game, but Drew Aller is an outstanding uh, quarterback. They've been waiting with bated breath for him to take over, and now with this opportunity and a, and a, and a national television audience will – We'll find out a lot more about them. Talent-wise, they don't have as many skilled players as Ohio State, 
but I do think they have more than Michigan. And Penn State does get a break in terms of the scheduling in the Big Ten. You know, they're, they're not having to play both Ohio State and Michigan in most years with the new scheduling that they have in that conference with the divisions going away uh, as as of the end of this year. Uh, I think you, they're, they're a legitimate top 7-8 team in my mind. Um, I mean, it, we'll, we'll, we just have to see them play against better teams. You know, Lars, neither Georgia or Michigan have played anybody, but they haven't done anything to warrant dropping them in your in your top ten. I dropped Ohio State all the way out of my top ten. I don't even have them in my just out category because they're having problems at quarterback. Um, you know, Ryan Day, when they go into Notre Dame a week after Saturday, uh, Saturday week, that could be a humbling experience for the Buckeyes. I'm very worried about them. Uh, I think Michigan and 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 Georgia, you know, are still fine, and we have not seen them struggle really. Although I think some in Georgia would tell you their quarterback uh, has not shown it yet. Beck has not been all that just yet, but they're so good in other areas that it it picks them up to some extent. But um, but I think Penn State may surpass Ohio State this year in the Big Ten, and they may be the the stiffest challenge to Michigan. Moving over to the Pac-12, uh, this is the last year. <laughs> what of the a Pac-12. great league, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, at the top to bottom, isn't the Pac-12 the deepest uh, conference in the yeah. nation? Right, right now, yeah, absolutely. And not only is it the deepest conference in the nation, uh, before they begin cannibalizing each other, which they will in a couple of weeks, you know, when USC plays Colorado and Colorado has to go to Oregon. You know, Oregon State gets a uh, a dose of of, uh, of some of the other teams that are at the top of their league. Washington State is now beaten Wisconsin at home, which which captured the imagination of a lot of people. Um, I think that the, the league not not only is the league more balanced top to bottom than any league, but it's also got more teams playing at a high level right now. You know, I mentioned Wazoo, Oregon. You know, Oregon's on the road to Texas Tech and, and come out of there a winner. That was important. Texas Tech is good. Uh, they may be the best 0-2 team in the country, and some Big 12 teams are going to find that out when they play them, including Texas. Texas has to go to, to Lubbock this year. Uh, but, I mean, that league is really playing at a very high level. Uh, you know, And the SEC, uh, we don't know really how good the, the top teams are because they haven't played anybody. But the rest of the league, we're just not sure about. You know, there could be some teams that are slipping mightily here. And uh, so the SEC crown is still on top, but it may be a little wobbly. You know what I mean? Pac-12, it's ironic, too, when you think about it, that the Pac-12, with all this negative publicity off the field that has led them to imploding as a conference, to have their best year in, you know, a long, long time. Um, staying in the Pac-12 just for one second, I want to talk about a former uh, 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 or young player who uh, grew up here in Alabama, and that's Bo Nix. I did a long story on Bo when he was a freshman at Auburn, and I, I, I think the world of him obviously didn't work out at Auburn. I think the reasons are complicated. But do you think Bo mm-hmm. Nix is um, an NFL starting quarterback quality kind of player? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Had to go to Oregon to stabilize his life and his, his football fortunes, I think. You know, the noise was was just so loud at Auburn. It always is. And I think a lot of times it's due to the sonic booms heard from Tuscaloosa to Auburn and vice versa. <laughs> I've never seen two programs impact the other in the same state more than those two do on a daily basis. And that had a lot to do, I think, with the upheaval that was taking place and the need to get Gus the hell out of there. And I think just as Gus Malzahn needed to get the hell out, Bo Nix did too. Uh, He got to Oregon. I had him a couple of times last year, as you know, and I look forward to having him again this year um, because he's he's so content with what he's doing. And, uh, you know, having Dillingham with him uh, in that first season before uh, Kenny got that job at Arizona State, which, by the way, I really look forward to seeing him next week in that Saturday game with USC. But they have replaced him beautifully. 
uh, Lanning has done a great job with that program, and uh, I think I think Bo loves the college town that is Eugene, and he's getting all the perks, but he doesn't have to live in that same sort of uh, fishbowl that he was living in in Auburn. Uh, the town of Eugene, its makeup. Uh, and again, not politically, but it's makeup. The, the actual infrastructure of Eugene, Oregon is very similar to Auburn. Yeah. And I think he's quite comfortable there. Um, okay, finally, let's circle back to Texas. Uh, is the Big 12 kind of theirs for the, for the taking? Do you, do you see Texas right now as a, uh, as a program, as a team that can make it to the college football playoffs? Well, that's certainly going to be the national narrative because when you go into Tuscaloosa and win, I mean, uh, you know, the, the last, uh, by the way, the last non-conference team, that's, I think I may have mentioned this on your show last week, was to beat Alabama at Alabama. Do you remember that one? Uh, Do you remember that one? Louisiana. Last Monroe. non-conference team, Monroe, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie Weatherby in Nick's first year, 2007. Uh, but when Mandel did it, we saw what happened there, right? He went on to win the Heisman Trophy, and everybody in Texas is saying the same thing now about about Texas and about yours. And so that's going to be the national narrative, no doubt about it. But uh, again, I, I just believe TCU, who I believe you'll see begin to right the ship. They play at Houston on Saturday. That's where I'm headed. Spencer and I will have that game in prime time. Um, I, I think I think TCU with Chandler Morris. I think Kansas State with Will Howard. Uh, may have something to say about that with Texas. You you better learn how to run with a full cup of success if you're the Longhorns. In the past, when they've said they were back, and I and they've all said it. Okay, they've all said it. Yeah, they really weren't back. Now they got to prove it. They have four games left on the road in Texas. Three of them, three of them are road games. They only have one road game in the Big Twelve, not in Texas. The other three are, and those people are loaded for bear. And the horns have a target on their back. Well, Tim, thanks so much. Uh, great insight. And uh, look forward to talking to you next week. Safe travels. Call on your games. And, uh, and uh, like, like I said, look forward to talking to you next week. Really appreciate it, Tim. You got it. All the best. Give my best to uh, Mr. Coulter. Yeah. Take care. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's Tim Brando. All right, we're going to be right back. This is Big Noon Sports. Built to win. Ball game. Alabama wins. Built for championship. Heading for the pylon. Get the race. Wins the race. Touchdown, Alabama. Built by Bama. Join us Saturday as the Crimson Tide heads to Tampa to take on South Florida. Our coverage begins at 11.30 on your home for Alabama football. Brought to you by Birmingham Racecourse. BirminghamRacecourse.com. You can be a winner, too. More Big Noon Sports coming up. Back in Big News Sports on this September 14th, 2023. Pastor Eric, uh, he lives in D.C. And it's an amazing thing when your big brother is your best friend. And uh, I so cherish our relationship. So happy birthday, Eric. All right. Joining us now is the owner of R&R Cigars, Reagan Starner. R&R is my favorite place in Tuscaloosa to hang out, located at uh, 2703 6th Street. And uh, go in there and get a great cigar, get a great drink. Reagan, how you doing today? Oh, man, I'm doing pretty good. Good, good. All right, so... Last week, uh, you actually, you, you, you beat Matt and I. Uh, Matt was a big 0-4 against the spread. I was 1-3, and, and uh, you eked out 2-2. Two and two. So for the year, through two weeks, we are all 4-4. Four and four. And uh, so you got a little bit of momentum going. Uh, so let's, let, let's get into the picks and, and, and your analysis of, uh, of, of four college football games. All right. Let's start with, uh, Tennessee at Florida. Tennessee is a six and a half point favorite. 
Matt took Tennessee. Your thoughts on this game, Reagan? I this one this one actually really intrigues me. Um, I'm really intrigued by a lot of things right now in college football. Uh, this COVID year is is got me has me going has me has me have some thoughts about a lot of things. Um, Tennessee is like. Tennessee's team is like ancient. Like every player on their starter is like a red shirt senior. So uh, I I, want to take Tennessee because they're like old uh, and they're playing against, you know, not Florida's team's not old. Um, I think that makes a difference. Um, But, and I've done this before, but I don't like Billy Napier. But I do believe that Florida will beat Tennessee. So I'm wow. going to go. You think Florida's going to beat them straight up? I just have, I just have a, I just have a, I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of, to me, it's kind of a, it's a huge game for Billy Napier and the Florida Gators. And I just, I have a sneaking suspicion that Florida beat Tennessee. I mean, Florida Florida has beaten Tennessee kind of like the way that we beat Tennessee. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened, but I think it'll be closer than the six. So I'll take Florida in the point. Do you think Billy Napier is going to be the long-term answer no. in Florida? No, I think, I think Billy Napier probably... I think there's a really high... I mean, if he loses Saturday... I think there's a real high likelihood Billy Napier's gone by the end of the year. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think he'll be there. I don't think he'll be there by the end of this season, let alone next season. You know, the obvious pick here to me seems to be Tennessee. But usually when the pick is so obvious, you got to go in the other direction. So I'm going with you. I'm going Florida. Uh, okay. Uh, this game is really intriguing to me, ma- mainly because of the spread. And that is uh, Georgia hosting South Carolina. Georgia is a 27.5 point home favorite over South Carolina, the Gamecocks. Your thoughts? 27.5 is a lot. Um I don't know. I I'm gonna go dog on this one too. Uh, I just twenty seven twenty seven and a half a lot. I think South Carolina can score. Uh, remains to be seen whether Georgia can score. Um, you know, this is a this is one of the only tough games on Georgia's schedule. Um, I, I yeah I. I probably shouldn't, but South Carolina and, and the 27 and a half point. You know, I'm going with you. I, I'm good buddies with Shane Beamer. Um, I, I think uh, South Carolina's quarterback has just uh, been running for his life, Spencer Rattler, but yet he's still playing at a pretty high level. Um, he's going to get pressured again. You know, but if South Carolina can just score 14 points, it's going to make Georgia's uh, task to cover this spread pretty tough. So all three of us, uh, I hate it when all three of us are taking the same team, but all three of us are going South Carolina. Okay, before we get to the Bama game, let's do uh, LSU at Mississippi State. LSU is a nine and a half point favorite on the road. Yeah, this one's this one's another weird one for me. Um, you either believe that LSU is the team people thought they were before the Florida State game, or you don't think LSU is very good because they lost Florida State. I think that LSU is actually probably a pretty good team. I think people are and don't want to admit that there are that the better teams in college football this year lie outside of the Southeastern Conference and Florida State is one of them but I do believe LSU is going to be a tough SEC team 
uh, in a very down year for the SEC. So I'm going to take LSU uh, versus Mississippi State. Yeah, um, I'm there with you too. I I think – there's been an overreaction against LSU because that Florida State game, you look at it at halftime, it was anybody's game to win. And LSU absolutely just played terrible in the second half, no doubt about it. But things didn't go, nothing went their, their way. And, uh, in, in college football, it seems like there's a, a snowball effect. And, and so, uh, I'm LSU as well. So that all three of us are on LSU, uh, minus nine and a half. Okay. Let's go. Uh, and I do want to get, uh, after this pick, I want to go to the NFL game tonight, uh, just to give you a little heads up, Reagan. I know we didn't talk about this before the show, but Eagles, uh, hosting the Vikings and Eagles are six and a half point favorites, but let's go to Bama, uh, at South Florida. The spread is, uh, Alabama. Minus 33. So Alabama's a 33 point favorite. Uh, can Alabama cover that? Oh, well, I think obviously the answer to the question is they can. Uh, but I'm, but I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty nervous about the offense right now. Um, I don't, I don't, there was a lot of things on Saturday's game that, were just like, did we run the ball out of anything other than the shotgun last week? I don't, I don't think that's kind of a rhetorical question. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it was, we talked about the middle Tennessee state game and we were, and we were saying, Oh, the offense, you know, we hope the offense is vanilla against middle Tennessee state. The, offense was very vanilla against them and we were like oh, okay good they didn't show anything and then it was the same exact offense we ran against middle tennessee versus texas and i was shocked uh because i was like well you know here i was thinking that we were not tipping our hand about what we were going to do on offense and we literally ran the same exact offense two days in two, two games in a row so that was weird um why you don't run the speed option with a quarterback that runs a four four forty? I don't know. Why? Like I, to me, I don't want to see a new quarterback play. I don't want to see. I'm fine with. I, I, I'm fine with Moro. I think Moro can be good. Um, but I like whatever they're doing on offense. I don't. It, I don't think it matters what quarterback you put in. You know why didn't Justice Haynes? Like I have so many questions about that game Saturday. Why didn't Justice Haynes get to play? You know, where were the where were where were the jumbo sets? You know? Uh if you're struggling in pass protection, bring an extra guy to the line so you're not, you know, just running five offensive linemen that are a sieve out there. If you're having snapping problems, why don't you move it why don't you move the quarterback under center? I, I mean, just just some weird stuff, right? Um, and I and and it, and it's like I don't know that we have an answer for any of those. Um, I hope they address it. I hope they fix it. But you know, if the play calling doesn't change on offense, then I, we're in trouble. Um, you know. I'd really like for our defense to start getting, or, you know, for our defense to start generating some holding calls. That would be cool. You know, um, I saw, I saw our, you know, their, their left tackle for Texas was hooking every, was hooking our, our edge rushers every play. I don't know. And I don't know how you overcome that, you know, other than I guess go down and put your hands up like a soccer player, but. You know, maybe that's what they need to do. I don't know. Um, long story short, I still believe in the talent of this team. I still believe in Nick Saban. I'm going to take Alabama uh, to cover the spread this weekend. All right. Well, just because you and Matt took Alabama, I'm going to take South Florida. Uh, maybe a cheap late touchdown allows them to cover. Clearly, Alabama is going to dominate this game. Middle Tennessee, Middle Tennessee State was a, is a better team than South Florida. So on paper, 
it, it, the spread should be bigger to me, and uh, I'm not sure why it isn't. Uh, so that tells me maybe Vegas knows something that we don't. All right, real quick, just tonight, who, who do you like? Uh, Vikings, Eagles, Eagles six and a half point favorite. I like the Eagles. Jalen Hurts, you know, I I, I, I like Jalen Hurts, man. I hope uh, I got I have friends on the Eagles staff. Uh, if I wasn't a Bucks fan, I'd probably be an Eagles fan just because of all the guys I know up in Philly. Um, so I like Jalen Hurts to, to to shut people up for another week tonight. So I'll take the Eagles. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Hey, Reagan, tell us what what's the latest going on at uh, R and R. Well, it's the bye week or with the away week, so it's uh, nice and quiet around Tuscaloosa this week. So great chance to come down to the mansion, and uh, I've been tweaking our cocktails a little bit. I I've been working on our old fashioned, um, and I've got some new. Uh, recipes that I've been cooking up. So our cocktail menu, we got some new cocktails on there. I just launched the liquid, the liquid crack cocktail. That's awesome. And, uh, I'm very excited about it. And, uh, it's a, it's a Cuban coffee drink. And I call it liquid crack because if you know Cuban coffee, it is literally crack. So, um, <laughs> Come on down, try some of these new cocktails, and uh, watch the NFL tonight. Watch college this weekend. Uh, whatever you want to do, we got Sunday tickets, so it'll be a fun so much, weekend no matter what. So much fun hanging out on the porch, having a cigar, having a cocktail, and just chilling. Uh, my favorite place in Tuscaloosa, Reagan. Thank you so much. Uh, hope I'll see you tomorrow. All right, you're listening to Big News Sports. We'll be right back. Inside the Alabama Crimson Tide with the Gary Harris Show. Hey, everybody. Coming up Friday on the Gary Harris Show. It's the TGIF edition. You know what that means. A lot of fun, including our Alabama football trivia contest. We'll be giving away another great prize from T-Town Menswear, T-Town Gallery, and the University Mall. My SEC point spread predictions. Plus, Adam Amin, Brett Pritchard with the All Report, and more. We'll have a lot of fun. Catch the Gary Harris Show Monday through Friday, 9 to 11 a.m. on Tide 100.9 and Tide 100.9.com. If you're a... Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. Just a small chance of a shower this afternoon, otherwise partially sunny, the high 85. Tonight, fair with the low at 66. For tomorrow and Saturday, a mix of sun and clouds both days with scattered showers around. Highs between 84 and 87. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 77 degrees in Tuscaloosa. This is the Big Noon Sports Network. All right, welcome back in to Big News Sports. Big thanks to uh, Tim Brando for uh, spending a half hour talking to us about his uh, career and uh, as a kid traveling around in a van with his dad, uh, going to different musical <laughs> events. And uh, just want to remind everybody that tomorrow we will be broadcasting live from Innisfree in Tuscaloosa from 12 to 2. Uh, love to have, uh, every, anyone and everyone come down and, and, uh, and just come and say hi and, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll put you on air and give us your analysis of the state of Alabama football. Um, Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama broker who graciously supports this program. Uh, she is going to be co-hosting as well, as well, just like she does every Friday down at Innisfree. All right. Thanks to everybody. My partner, Matt Coulter, behind the glass, Justin and everyone at Tide 100.9, uh, our affiliates, Gadsden and Aniston, uh, Walt Williams, who is the straw that stirs the drink. We will see you tomorrow. Everybody be safe. Looking for a place to watch.